thank you, Jeff, for, for being here. Um, and I'm not going to do a formal introduction, but we'll, we'll work through this a little bit. You've been out of the Senate now for, what, 14 months now? Right. Have you recovered? I have. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I recommend that uh, course of action. I've, I've urged it on some of my uh, former colleagues there, yeah. I actually can think of some that I'd like to recover to uh, leave too, right. but maybe it's for different reasons. Right. Um, so you, you've um, had a just a distinct, absolutely distinguished career in in um, uh, government activities, from being an attorney general at New Mexico and, and then to being at the Senate. But your family's operated differently. I mean, I understand your wife. Your son are all entrepreneurs. I mean, what happened to you? Well, some, someone, uh, someone had to support the family, so that's what my wife has done as I've uh, pursued uh, uh, public service, but uh, uh, I, I'm somewhat the black sheep of the family in that I, I, did not, uh, I did not go into business. You're right. Well, now maybe that you're back in New Mexico, you can... Um be encouraged by them to do something entrepreneurial. Well, I, I've been looking around. I haven't found it yet, but I'm, I'm looking around. Yeah. You earned your degree at Stanford, uh, your, your law degree at Stanford. Uh, one of the things I really appreciated during the, during the time uh, while you were in the Senate is you periodically came back to Stanford. And I think of a couple of times a year, most of us saw you, where you'd spend a basically a full day talking with people about what was happening in the energy area. Um, any comments about that, the whole thing? Because uh, a lot of, we don't see all the members of the Senate actually operating that way. Well, I do think uh, there's uh, a need to have sort of an ongoing educational process, uh, particularly in a field like energy where, where uh, there's new developments all the time. and. Uh, uh, I, I don't know the extent to which most members of Congress really uh, are up to speed on on what's happening in industry and, and what's happening in technology in particular. So, so I think that's a that's something we need to keep working on as to how we how we better connect the educational institutions with uh, with the Congress. We used to have an Office of Technology Assessment, in the Congress that was shut down back in the mid '90s. Uh, I think it uh, was a mistake to shut it down myself. I think it uh, provided a useful service that uh, we, we haven't yet uh, figured out how to, how to replace very well. Yeah, I knew Jack Gibbons when he was running right. that thing, and it, it, it really um, did a cutting edge analysis of, of the big issues. You have Congressional Budget Office and Congressional Research Service. Congressional Research Service never was quite the same level. But if you think about institutionally, uh, is there any way of any of those that, that you'd like to sort of expand or recreate? Would you recreate the uh, Congressional Budget Office, if you could? Uh, not the Congressional Budget Office, the Office, Office of Technology, Technology Assessment. Assessment. Well, I don't think it's practical to suggest that it be recreated at this point. Uh, I think the, the stars are not properly aligned to do something like that. but. I think the best that can be done given the current circumstances is to find better ways of connecting the research activities and, and uh, uh, institutions uh, such as Stanford with what's going on at, in, in the Congress and in the administration more generally. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, we've, we've uh, at Stanford and I know MIT and Berkeley and Yale and. They've all been working at that, and, and uh, I think that, that there's been really good progress, but there's a lot of barriers to that communication. But let me go on. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the dysfunction in Congress. Uh, we've all talked about it, and, and many of us have, have been unhappy about it. Uh, we, we hear about the uh, polls about having the the, the, the rating of, of Congress, the approval ratings is just down in the, well, I think they're still in double digits, but they're down close to almost a single digit rating. Uh, 
I saw one helpful note, and I hope you can comment on this, whether it's a trend or whether it's just a blip. The last budget was approved in what seemed to be actually real bipartisan effort without quite the rancor that we've seen. Um, it actually passed a week before the deadline, which to me was, was just amazingly early for um, how Congress has been acting recently. The debt limit was raised uh, with the clean bill. Now, just parenthetically, I think the debt limit is one of the dumbest policies we have, but we do have it, but it was raised with the clean bill. So do you think that this is a beginning of some bipartisan cooperation? Uh, we may be seeing an upswing in, in, uh, in the functionality of Congress, or am I just being aggressively optimistic? No, I, I think both of those uh, things that you, you referred to, the passing of a, of a funding bill to get us through the end of the fiscal year, the end of September, and the passage of a debt ceiling increase that gets us into 2015, both of those are very positive. And, uh, I took him as signs that uh, Speaker Boehner had decided that it was, he was no longer needing to, to adhere to the wishes of some of his more right-wing uh, uh, members, and he, he, needed to, he needed to go ahead and get on with the business of, uh, of uh, the government and, and uh, get away from this idea that we're threatening to shut down the government, we're threatening to default on our debt, uh, to me, that was a very destructive uh, uh, course. Uh, uh, the, the threat to shut down the government, of course, first came up uh, uh, when Newt Gingrich was speaker and, uh, in the mid-'90s, and, and the, threat, the serious threat to default on the debt came up in 2011, in August of 2011. And I hope that both of those uh, issues are now behind us. Uh, so that's, that's on, the, on the positive side. On the negative side, as far as the dysfunction, I think uh, the Senate is still uh, putting in place many obstructions to, to, to the President's efforts to fill his administration with key people. And we have some at this uh, conference who are in that group and would like to be confirmed by the Senate. Uh, I think most of that is just uh, uh, continued retribution uh, against Harry Reid and, and Democrats for having changed the rules on, on filibuster. Uh, so I, I think that's, that's uh, uh, very unfortunate, but it's a reality, uh, continues to be a reality. The other, the other reality, as I see it, is that, uh, uh, you know, we, we work on a two-year cycle in the Congress, and uh, at some stage in that cycle, you, sh you essentially give up on a serious legislative effort and move into campaign mode. And unfortunately, I think that's already happened in this Congress. I think it's happened sooner in this Congress than in, in most. Can you quantify a little bit among the, you, you, you serve, uh, how long, what fraction of the time of your, of your term in, say, in the Senate are you in campaign mode? Um, is it the last half of the time and only the first half of the Congress? Do you, do you operate in, in, uh, in legislative mode or give you some quantification? Well, I think it varies. And uh, uh, I think uh, essentially the leadership, both in the House and the Senate, make decisions about what they're willing to bring to the floor and, and which which issues they want their members to take votes on and which members, the, which issues they want to, to force the other party to take votes on. And, and so, so that sort of controls uh, when, you, when you are still in legislative mode versus when you are uh, mm -hmm. into nothing but campaign mode. And as I say, I think we've, we've seen that this Congress, uh, this two-year Congress shift into campaign mode more quickly than most Congresses do. And, uh, that's not good for the country, but that's the reality that I think we're faced with in Washington today. One of the things that I've, I've always found striking is it, it was some of the research that looks at the distribution of, of, of uh, people in Congress and in the general population from, from conservative to liberal. And if you look at the general population of the U.S., it's a normal bell curve. Uh, 
with, with the big bulk of the people in, in, in the, the middle, whether they call themselves Democrats or Independents or Republicans, somewhat in, a, in the middle, and then they tail down to, to both of the extremes. And you do the same thing for, for the composition of Congress, and it doesn't look at all like a bell curve. It's two humps. It'll, it goes up with a high peak at the very liberal level, and then a high peak at the very conservative level, and very few people in the middle there. Uh, is, is, is there ways to move beyond that, or is that what, we just had, what you've had to learn to live with as you're a member of the Senate, uh, that you do have this double hump camel uh, if, in that distribution of it? Well, I, I can't explain all of the reasons for it, but clearly the number of folks who are so-called moderates in the middle uh, uh, have, have decreased in the Senate. You've, you've left. Yeah. There's, there's yeah. two of you I can think of, and you're both gone. Yeah. Uh, in the House, of course, some of it can be explained by gerrymandering. Uh, I do think you, the House, uh, the, the state legislatures have written the, the rules on, on their districts or, or, or redrawn their districts uh, in ways that, uh, uh, that ensure that you get more of this polarization. Now, of course, California's trying to change that by, by taking the the reapportionment issue away from the legislature and, and giving it to a commission, and other states are thinking about doing that same kind of thing, but uh, I think there are, there are very substantial forces out there uh, lobbying and, and uh, pressuring the Congress to uh, remain polarized on a lot of these key issues, and, and uh, members of Congress tend to respond to the pressures that uh, that are exerted on them both when they're running for office, but also uh, uh, once they get there. And, and in California, besides the redistricting, we have a system of open primaries where in the primaries you can vote for whoever you want, and then it's the two highest vote getters run against each other. They could be from the same parties, they can be opposite parties. I think the jury's still out as to whether that's gonna work towards eliminating that polarization but in my mind, we, we got to try because yeah. it, 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 the dysfunctional is endogenous to the system. It's not exogenous, as far as I can tell. No, no, it's it's. We need to find ways to to get the Congress functioning better. No doubt, no doubt about it. Good. Let me turn to energy, since this is Energy con Congress. Um, the alternative fuels tax credits have all expired. Congress, I believe, is discussing these tax benefits. We've had an on and off system. Uh, they may continue, they may not continue. They start, they stop. Um, what's the state of play as, as you see it? Well, I think uh, Ron Wyden, of course, who's the new chair of the Finance Committee there in the Senate, just in the last week or so, uh, has said his top priority is trying to pass a bill to extend or put back in place some of these tax credits, uh, uh, not just for renewable energy, but for research and development, a whole range of, of tax credits that expired at the end of 2013. Uh, I hope he's able to do that. I, th I think he'll be able to do that in some form, uh, but uh, it's a struggle to get it done. Uh, you know, we've got, this, we've got these two different tax codes. Uh, we've got the one that is, a, is something of a permanent tax code, and then we've got all of these provisions which were passed after the Budget Control Act became law in the, in the 70s. And, and these new provisions, you, they are short term and they expire because in order to extend them and make them longer term, you have to find a way to offset the loss of revenue to the government. So it's a, uh, it, it's a, it's a very different circumstance with regard to these tax credits, and it, and it leads to very bad policy. Uh, we don't have long-term policy in these areas because, because the Congress doesn't want to find the money to extend these tax provisions for long enough that they can do a whole lot of good. Now, uh, Ron Whiting, of course, is in, in the Senate. Um, let's assume that the Senate can pass it. 
Do you want to speculate on the likelihood of the House and then agreeing to extend these because the political composition there is somewhat different? It is somewhat different. Uh, I, I don't know for certain, but uh, I think there is a prospect that uh, they, they could get uh, some cooperation. Again, this depends upon the leadership of the, uh, the House and whether they're willing to let this issue come to the, to the floor of the House uh, and be voted on uh, uh, on a majority basis uh, with, with both parties participating. I mean, if, if they can, you know, John Boehner, to his credit, uh, did not follow the Hastert rule uh, on either the, the funding of the government or the increase in the debt ceiling here that, that occurred in the last six weeks. Uh, and if he, will, if he will, again, not follow the Hastert rule in connection with tax extenders, uh, I think the votes are there in the House to, to pass an extender package. And could you make sure everybody knows what the Hastert rule is? Well, the Hastert is. rule basically was, a, uh, I don't think uh, 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 Dennis Hastert was the first, uh, I'm, I'm sure he was not the first uh, Speaker of the House to, to use it, but basically saying he would not bring things to the floor that he could not pass with uh, Republican votes. Uh, and, uh, and Nancy Pelosi followed it to a degree on, on the Senate side, as, I mean on the Democratic side as well, and said that she would not bring things to the House floor unless she could pass them with votes from, from the Democrats. Uh, that's not a very good way to run the House of Representatives. Uh, you can't make progress if you can't get both parties, the, the, the reasonable members of both parties, to uh, have a chance to vote. and, and, and and be willing to bring things forward that a reasonable, uh, a reasonable majority would uh, uh, be glad to support. Does the Senate use some variation of that rule, rule as well, or is that just the House, House way of operating? Well, we don't, of course, in the Senate, uh, we still have the, the filibuster in place. You still yeah. have to get 60 votes. Uh, to move legislation. The only changes in the filibuster rule that, that were brought about through this so-called nuclear option that Senator Reid uh, uh, invoked related to appointments uh, and did not relate to legislation. So, so it's a different uh, can of worms there. Uh, usually the struggle in the Senate is for the majority party, at this time, of course, the Democrats, uh, to, to get uh, five or six Republicans to join with them and uh, be able to get over the 60 vote threshold, uh, and then they're into a majority vote mm -hmm. situation again. Good. Um, President Obama announced his climate a action plan. A lot of it would be adjustment by administrative agencies, but it would seem to me that um, I'll, that adjustment cannot be sort of unilaterally the administration because there's the appropriations committees and, and they have a lot of informal authorities even when they're not voting on, on things. So there's, there should be a cooperative action. Can you comment on how well this is working both within the administration and collaboratively with the relevant parts of Congress? Well, I think it's too soon to know. Uh, the. Uh, Dave Danielson is going to be on the program here a little later this morning. He can give you sort of line and verse on, on what's, uh, what progress is being made on the president's climate change uh, plan. Uh, uh, I, think, uh, I think the reality, uh, though, is that uh, it, there's a very limited number of things that the executive branch can do without some agreement by the Congress. As you point out, uh, they've got to have funding uh, to do a lot of things. Uh, the main, the main uh, administrative action, of course, is, uh, is the effort that EPA's engaged in in trying to uh, deal with uh, emissions from existing power plants. And they're trying to put together a rule that they could put out for comment uh, to accomplish that, uh, that that's uh, highly controversial. Uh, but uh, I don't see, Congress is not in a position to stop them from doing that. Uh, but uh, over the coming years, uh, there's no doubt that Congress can throw up obstacles and, and make it difficult for the implementation of that rule 
uh, to be effective uh, through the funding process if, if the Congress chooses to do that. Yeah, I, I go back, and one of my frustrations in, in looking at the policy process is having seen how it can work. And I was at what was called the Federal Energy Administration. It was a predecessor of the Department of Energy. And there was about four of our offices that ultimately became the Energy Information Administration. And we had things happening there that I just don't see happening anymore. Like uh, when, when the first CAFE standards were passed, um, that was in about 1975. And there were just many variants that there was discussed, but I would get a call each day from Jim Wetzler, who was a congressional staffer, who was saying, here's the various variants that are going to be discussed in the next day, both in discussion of markup sessions, and say, you know, do the sort of analysis that you do on it. So we'd do some numerical quantitative. I'd pass it up through the administration. He'd pass it up through the congressional committees. And that was explicit agreement between the administration and the Congress. And we did that. Same with phase D control of crude oil prices. Does that still happen? Can it be made to happen, that sort of collaboration as opposed to what it sounded like in the State of Union address where President Obama was saying, well, I'm just going to do it myself because you guys aren't cooperating. Am, am I being unrealistic about what can happen or, or what? I don't even know how to ask this question. Well, I, I, I do think we've got a real difficult circumstance in Washington of of getting good cooperation between the current Congress and the current president, and uh, there's just no way to sugarcoat that. I mean, it's, it's just there. Uh, and uh, the president, I think, is anxious to do what he can while he is still in the, in the White House uh, to move some of these items forward on the agenda. And, uh, and there are some in Congress who are anxious to, to prevent anything uh, constructive uh, being done that might have uh, President Obama's name on it. Uh, and, and, and there are legitimate disagreements about policy, too, uh, mm -hmm. under, which underlie a lot of this. So, uh, so we've got, a, we've got a, major, uh, uh, a major disconnect going on between the Congress and the administration right now. Well, talk about disconnect. Um, why do you think it's so difficult for the president to come down to a clean decision on the Keystone XL pipeline? As I, as somebody who believed in those uh, energy policy triangle, that is the environment, security, and, and the economy, and look at it, it looks like a no-brainer. For all, it doesn't really hurt the environment, and even the, the, the um, uh, analysis from the administration said it's not going to have an impact on the, on the environment of any significance. It's good for the economy. It's good for security. Why is it so difficult? Well, I, I, I personally think uh, it's been a mistake to, to put this off and put this off and put this off. Uh, uh, I, I think it, it is a decision that could have been made even, even a couple of years ago. And, uh, and I think that uh, that probably would have been... Uh, uh, to everyone's, uh, in, in everyone's interest. I, I think the recent report that's come out of the State Department saying that the impact on, on climate change will not be uh, uh, substantial, I think uh, it, it provides a, a basis for the president to go ahead and approve the project. I don't know when he will or, or whether he will, but I would, uh, I would think that uh, it will be difficult based on that report uh, to conclude otherwise. Well, I, I, I certainly hope uh, uh, this can move ahead. I was just in a workshop we had at Stan Stanford at uh, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement at 20, and had the negotiators there. And basically, all the people who looked at energy could say, you know, within the spirit of what we talked about in the Free Trade Agreement, this should go forward. You, you shouldn't be blocking this because it's totally within the spirit of what we've discussed. You know, when we put that on top of what's a spectacularly good relationship between Canada, Mexico, and the United States. But 
I don't know, that's, I'm supposed to be asking you questions, so I don't want to editorialize too much on this. Um, let's turn to the role of the states, because I think you've been doing a lot of uh, thinking about the state roles and moving forward in policy. Well, how is, what's your view of, uh, sort of generally, about what's happening in the states and moving forward a, a policy objective? Well, yeah, uh, we have been uh, trying to spend time focused on what states have been doing by way of policy. In fact, we're working with uh, George uh, Schultz and uh, Jeremy Carl and, and David Fetter there in, in the Hoover Institute. And of course, uh, Dan Riker uh, uh, is head of the center that I'm associated with there at uh, the law school. We're trying to put out a report identifying what some of these policies are that have been most successful in promoting more use of renewables, in promoting more, uh, more progress on efficiency, increased efficiency. Uh, I think the, the interesting thing is some states are doing a great deal and are doing it uh, with substantial success. Other states are doing very little. And what we're trying to do is basically get the information uh, uh, to folks and say, uh, uh, you know, if you're interested in pursuing either energy efficiency or more use of renewables, uh, these are policies you ought to look at uh, because they seem to work. And so that's, uh, I think that's positive. I particularly think it's, it's, a, it's a useful exercise considering that the EPA may determine, they haven't as far as I know, but they may determine that a lot of what they would like to see done with regard to reduction of emissions on existing power plants needs to be delegated to the states to do and, and states would then be, presumably would be looking at what are the options uh, if, if we're gonna, if we're, if we're gonna be responsible for reducing emissions, uh, what, are the, what are the different tools that we could look at uh, to get that done? What are some of your favorite things that are happening in the states, just one or two examples of what, what you, well, you smile on him with approval. Well, one that I've uh, been uh, very uh, intrigued with is this project, this uh, activity going on here in Colorado, which they call community solar gardens, uh, where, where they basically uh, uh, have authorized uh, the, the establishment of, of uh, solar projects uh, that can either be done by utilities or by private developers or by nonprofits. And, uh, and the idea there is that instead of everyone putting solar panels on his or her roof, uh, regardless of which direction their roof is facing, uh, instead of that, uh, a developer can come in and, and put in a larger uh, solar project and sell uh, subscriptions uh, or uh, uh, portions of that to people in the area, and they would then get the benefit on their utility bills mm -hmm. under this net energy metering uh, uh, system, which is in place. They would be able to get uh, compensated for the, the portion of the power that's produced from that project that they have paid for, uh, basically. And so uh, uh, it's a way to expand the use of renewables. So it's a way to build more solar uh, production uh, capacity, and it's a way to do it in, uh, so that it doesn't, uh, a lot of that cost doesn't wind up in the rate base, uh, because in fact you've got people who have paid to, to get the project yeah. constructed. Yeah, now, you, you've been looking at some of the uh, uh, renewable portfolios or renewable energy efficiency standards. Could, can you talk about that among, the very, uh, among states? Uh, is that something that seems to be gaining traction? Well, I think when you look at it sort of in very broad terms, it seems to me at the federal level, the most effective policies that the federal government has put in place to promote energy efficiency or, or renewable energy are the production tax credit that has promoted more use of wind and the investment tax credit that's, uh, that's promoted more use of solar. At the state level, I don't think there's any doubt that the renewable portfolio standard has been the most effective uh, policy for causing utilities to put in place uh, renewable power. And about, uh, about 20, 29 or 30 states now have renewable portfolio standards at some level. Uh, 20 states do not. 
Uh, but I think if, if we're going to see more deployment of renewable power in the next uh, decade, uh, uh, we need to recognize that this has been the most effective tool that's been available. It's not that it's the only one or not that it's necessarily uh, uh, the uh, end all and be all in this, in this area, but it's, it's been the most effective and, and uh, we need to acknowledge that and urge states to consider it. Any last words? I see that they didn't fix the defective problem of this monitor. It, you know, it, it went down to zero too quickly yesterday, and it did so again today. But any last words that you want to give people before we have to end? Well, not really. I think uh, this is a great conference. I'm glad to be uh, involved in it again this year, and I congratulate you and Jay and all the all the organizers of the conference. It's uh, it's impressive to see uh, the presentations that have been made. Great. Well, thank you so much for your contrib contribution here and your contribution to the nation, uh, fundamentally, and your continuing linkage with Stanford. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great.